Well, hello and welcome to this workshop on the road scholarship. This is a special workshop for many reasons, not least because this is our first workshop for the admission cycle 2023-2024. We are very delighted to start our programs and workshops for the next year. I'm sure those of you who are returning to us will know that we organize quite a lot of workshops on university applications and scholarships to just familiarize you with uh, the processes so that you are in a much better position to, to make those applications. Um, this workshop is being recorded. So please um, know that if you switch on your camera and speak in the meeting, you will appear in the recording. So if you do not wish to appear in the recording, please um, feel free to message us your question and we will take that up. Um, but if you have any questions about recording, uh, you can always direct them to us at projectedueaccess at gmail.com. With that, uh, this is how the session is going to look like. We're going to uh, talk to you about a little bit, a little bit about Project Edu Access. I will introduce um, our panelists today, uh, and then we'll delve into the substantive bit of the session where we talk about uh, the scholarship. Uh, the eligibility, the criteria, and the application process. And we'll then introduce you to your best friends for the roads application process this year. Um, well, as most of you know, access to higher education, leadership, and professional opportunities is uh, a privilege that most people from marginalized communities are denied. Um, and there are a number of reasons for this, including cost, information, and other barriers. And Project Edu Access is a non profit initiative that's aimed to uh, improve inclusivity in higher education and professional opportunities, um, especially uh, for students from marginalized communities. And we do um, a range of things, for example, mentorship, um, support, and uh, organizing such workshops that. Uh, just address the information as asymmetry that there is. Um, these are, except for me, the two wonderful people who are going to uh, you know, take the session today, SM Khalid, who uh, is an incoming MSc in Modern South Asian Studies candidate at the, at the University of Oxford, and he is the Rhodes Scholar-elect uh, for this year. Um, essentially, Khalid, um, was selected as a Rhodes Scholar in the last cycle. Um, we're then joined by Ritika, who is a regular at these workshops with us. Uh, Ritika is just finishing her MSc in neuroscience and will start a refill um, in neuroscience as well. And she is a Rhodes Scholar from a year ago. Um, and then I am going to do the least amount of talking, hopefully. Um, and I'm doing the refill here at Oxford, and I am a 2018 Rhodes Scholar. Quite a lot of things have changed since, but some have remained the same. So I hope I'm able to answer your questions. While this workshop will be done in English, uh, we are also able to answer questions in Hindi, Urdu, Bengali, and Kashmiri. So if you are not comfortable asking your question in English, please feel free to speak in any of the languages that I mentioned and we will try and answer your question in that language and translate it for the rest of the um, audience. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Ritika, who is going to take us to the substantive parts of the workshop first, and then uh, to, to follow. Hello, everyone. Thanks so much, Samir. And it's lovely to be here today. Uh, in my section, I'm just going to take you briefly over the uh, steps in the application and give you a brief overview of what the Rhodes Scholarship is. is. So as you probably know, it's a fully funded scholarship, which um, pays all your tuition fee for postgraduate study at the University of Oxford. And they also give you a stipend that you can use for uh, paying your accommodation charge and day-to-day -day expenses. Um, as always, it is only for the University of Oxford. And um, if you, there is a document on the Rhodes uh, Trust website that details all the different kinds of courses, graduate 
courses that you can study uh, with this scholarship at Oxford. Um, now, there are five scholarships awarded for Indian students. You can study any field. There are very, very few combinations of courses that uh, maybe you cannot do, but you must know that this is a scholarship that is for a minimum of two years and a maximum of three years. Um, for the minimum of two years, there, you can do things like one MS, two MSCs or two MAs, or you can do something called as a BA with senior status, which means that you do a bachelor's degree, but instead of completing it in three years, you can do it in two years, or you can do a DPhil, uh, for which, in which case you can get the scholarship for three years and so on. So there are several combinations, several fields, several um, different kinds of courses you can take if you have the scholarship. And um, this is not a need-based scholarship. It is, there are several other criteria that decide whether or not you become a Rhodes Scholar, which we'll go through. Can we go to the next, uh, next slide, please? Thank you. Um, so the Rhodes Scholarship has lots of constituencies, which uh, means that groups of countries or con individual countries from where people can be in order to apply for this scholarship. But the good thing now is that um, there is something known as a global scholarship as well. So if you do not fit into any one constituency, you can apply for a global scholarship. Or there are other things as well that we can take up in the questions, like if you belong to two constituencies, what do you do? Um, but in general, for Indians, you have to have an Indian citizenship. Even if you are a refugee asylum seeker in India, you are eligible. Um, and you must have uh, studied formally as at an educational institution in India for a minimum of four of the last 10 years. And either you should have completed your 10th or 12th standard or basically high school in India, or you should have, it should be in the final year of, or have just completed undergraduate studies at, an uni at a university in India. Now there is um, an age criteria as well. Um, if you are between 18 to 23 years of age on the 1st October of this year, that is you must have been born after the after October 1 in 1999 and before October 2 in 2005 in that age range, uh, then you're eligible. Or if you are older, if you're more than 23 years old, you, are, you can still be eligible, but you must be under the age of 27 and should have completed your un first undergraduate degree either on October 1, 2022 or after October 1, 2022. So it's important to understand that the recency of having completed your undergraduate degree is given priority here. Um, and yeah, so in general, completed a bachelor's degree normally by July of 2024 with an academic background and grade that meets or exceeds the entry requirements of uh, Oxford. So whenever you're applying for this scholarship, you have to have a broad sense of what courses that you'd want to put into your application. You're not uh, bound to study those, but um, you should have a sense of which ones you're interested in. And so it's always a good idea to see whether you meet the entry requirements for those courses. Now, Broadly, the will of the person who uh, first started these, this scholarship enlisted four criteria for selection of scholars that's been constant ever since the scholarship was established. First being academic excellence, and that is very important because the um, the application process at Oxford is really competitive right now, and you need to have a first class honors degree or equivalent, which basically means that you should try to be at the top of your class, but it's not completely, um, it's easier if you're at the top of your class, basically. Then um, energy to use their talents to the full as demonstrated by mastery in areas like sports, music, basically a lot of extracurricular pursuits, uh, including where teamwork is involved. But there is a common myth that um, you have to have, uh, you have to be brilliant at one or more of these things in order to be a Rhodes Scholar. That's not completely true. There are many ways, many combinations of abilities you have, you can have to be a Rhodes Scholar. So there is no one template, uh, really. Um, it's always good to have diverse interests, though, in general, because that gives you diverse perspectives. 
then uh, general abilities of being truthful, courageous, having devotion to duty, sympathy for and protection of the weak, kindliness, unselfishness, and fellowship, things that we are taught in kindergarten, but sometimes forget as we go through life. So just uh, sticking to your basic values and demonstrating that and in, in some way through your work or your ambitions for the future and moral force of character, instincts to lead and to take an interest in fellow human beings. Now, in the matter of instincts to lead, a lot of people think that you have to have your own organization or you have to be the president of XYZ thing. That's not always uh, true. Um, it's great if you are, there's a lot that you can learn, but even if you've done something like led a project for, uh, for your coursework, even that's good enough anything like anything that where you organized efforts of people or organized knowledge for others anything where you had to um, stand for others is good enough there's no big or small in this um, just a brief run through the application process um, there is the first stage the written stage which is open now uh, the application deadline for this stage being 1st of August midnight, just before midnight. Uh, you have to submit your official transcripts, whatever you may have up until that point. Uh, a CV, uh, the structure of which I will briefly mention in a few minutes. A personal statement and an academic statement of study. These are usually the most important parts of your application and they have word limits and reference letters. The number of reference letters required are, will also be covered soon and are all mentioned in detail on the Roads Trust website. And once you've uh, passed the written stage, you have an interview stage, which usually runs from September to November, and there can be three or four interviews. Usually there are three, sometimes four in case something happens and the interviews go online. For example, in my year, we had four rounds of interviews and I think in Khalid's year, they had three. I'm not sure, maybe he can uh, cover that, but yeah, three or four interviews. Um, so the CV is one of the first things you have to prepare for the scholarship application. There is a requirement that it should not exceed two A4 pages and you have to have a font size of 12. Um, it is a very good idea to stick to this. Don't try to um, you know, make the font really small so that you can fit more. Just don't do it. The reason why it's two pages is because you can highlight the important things, the the things, and, and in a manner that's concise and yet conveys whatever is required. Um, it's good to have sections in your CV, and these are a few pointers for helping create those sections. So you can cover your academic qualifications in one section, prizes, scholarships, positions of leadership, and so on. Don't want to read from the slide here, but um, make it organized. Don't make it just a list of things you've done. Rather, make it a nicely compartmentalized um, presentation of what you are as a professional and beyond. And yes, over to Khalid. Thank you, Ritika. I hope you can hear me. Okay. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, so the uh, written part of the scholarship uh, includes, as, uh, as stated in the previous slide, the CV, and now the two important statements. The two important statements are the personal statement of the SE and the academic statement. So the personal statement, as you can check the details about these statements in the, uh, the document provided on the Rhodes website, but uh, the personal statement is basically a statement about who you are, because you're trying to present yourself or your person to a team of selectors who have never met you. So you have to try to uh, uh, you know, present yourself in a way uh, that is, uh, asked by the Roads Trust, and that is precisely why they have set out certain prompts for you. There are three prompts that you have to include in your statement that you have to stick to them. The way you organize those prompts in your uh, statement is going to vary from person to person, uh, and you can, um, uh, you know, use your own description how to do that. Uh, but basically, 
uh, what the person statement is about is how to address your general interest in, uh, and activities and give a sense of what you are, what you have been interested in, what are your passions and what are the beliefs that you feel most strongly about and what are the areas you are, your strengths lie, and what is it that you're doing outside of your academic studies and so on. And so uh, if you can move to the next slide, please. So the Roads Trust uh, asks you to, um, uh, in your SOP, reflect on three areas. That is the self, the world, and the others. The self is yourself, of course. The others is your relation to uh, the people around you, the community you live in, perhaps, and the world, of course, the wider world in general. So uh, one of the roads prompts is that which road scholar quality do you display most strongly and how are different contexts and people helping you to develop other qualities, right? So the instinct is to say perhaps that you display all the roads, uh, uh, all the road scholar qualities that you display them very strongly, everything, you are a great athlete, you are a great debater, and so on. But uh, the operative word here, the operative term here is most strongly so uh, the suggestion is that you must uh, stick to one, two, or however many criteria or however many qualities you think you display most strongly. And when you uh, decide upon that, then you have to uh, you know, think about how you're going to integrate, in the, integrate that in your SOP and so on. And then, of course, when it comes to uh, uh, your relation to others, uh, how, would you point, how would you like to learn from uh, roads and the Oxford community in general, because these are very large, diverse communities. Uh, the Oxford University and uh, the road scholarships, they're prestigious, selective. What is it that you're bringing to the table and what is it that you uh, want to uh, learn from them? What are the areas that you feel you are lacking in? What are the areas that you feel you can still grow in? And uh, what are the things that you'd like to learn from them? Right? Things like that. And from your place in the world, how will you use your energies and talents to address humanity's pressing challenges? The, uh, uh, the most common uh, move here is to perhaps, you know, exaggerate and say, oh, well, I'm going to solve this problem. Uh, this is how I will solve this problem. Uh, I'm going to solve problem of water crisis, climate change and whatnot. But what, uh, what this prompt is asking you to do is reflect on how even if in a very small way, you can bring meaningful and significant change in the community around you and how that is important to the world, right? So even if you feel what you have already done, uh, it's very small, it seems insignificant, but it is important to you or to the people around you, uh, that is more than enough. And, 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 and I would suggest that please, as far as possible, please uh, display humility, do not over exaggerate your achievements or whatever. Uh, just stick to the prompts that they give you, and uh, and and that's and you are more than sorted and more than uh, prepared to tackle the SOP. And after that, we have another important component, which is the academic statement study, which is 350 words. Uh, the statement of purpose is 750 words. So earlier, there used to be a thousand word statement, but now they have. Uh, you know, kind of demarcated it between these two statements because, uh, as is outlined in the Rhodes document, that admissions to the Oxford University is so competitive that they want to prepare you beforehand uh, for the eventual admission should you get the Rhodes scholarship. So the academic statement of study is basically about what course you want to study at Oxford. Uh, uh, what are your um, uh, do you fulfill the criteria for that course? Do you fulfill the criteria for that course? And uh, do you meet the entry requirements? And are you aware of what is going on in that field? What is the contribution that you'd like to make? And so on and so forth. And uh, if you are, of course, doing, applying for a PhD, it is better to provide a proposed research area. And uh, you know, any researchers working in Oxford of who you are aware and uh, you'd like to work under. It's always good to have an idea of the course and the faculty uh, uh, who will be teaching you that course while writing the academic statement. So uh, while the SOP can be more subjective, it can be more perhaps anecdotal, we can come back to, the, to that later, the use of anecdotes in SOP. Uh, academic statement is usually more precise to the point and uh, you know, um, stating clear terms what we want to do and 
which area do you want to work with it's okay to have some ambiguity to not be clear exactly what you want to do but a, a broad idea of where your research interests lie or where is it that you want to end up eventually with all of them. So uh, after the academic statement of study, can you have the next slide, please? Yeah, so the reference letters, the LORs, they're really important uh, because uh, in a way, they are one component of your application, if an application that is not under your control. So obviously you can discuss with your referee, uh, your achievements and so on, but uh, it will eventually be the referee who will write this. just in an anonymized manner. So uh, you can get, you can submit maximum five references. So minimum, you need three academic references and one uh, character reference. And the fifth one is an optional one. You can either uh, opt for an academic reference or a character reference. I only submitted four, so that's not an issue. Uh, so uh, the three academic references or four that you submit should be from people who have taught you at the undergraduate level or at the postgraduate level, if you have done your masters, uh, and they should have graded you. That is, they know, um, uh, you know, they know your academic abilities. They can rank you and so on and so forth. You can go on the website, and there is, uh, uh, there's a, uh, there are guidelines for the referees. There's a separate document for that. You can access that. And the character referee is uh, meant to give the roads trust, the selectors, an idea of who you are outside the classroom. So. Uh, what what qualities do you have apart from your academic abilities, of course, and what are your leadership skills, and uh, how well uh, do you perform in extracurricular activities and whatever. So the idea is that a good referral or a good reference letter is from a person who knows you well. They might not be very well known. They might not be, let's say, the, the head of the department or a very established scholar. But if that person knows you well and can attest to your abilities in a convincing manner, uh, they can tell where you stand in the uh, class, they can tell where you stand in the department, they can outline your achievements, they can also perhaps tell them uh, uh, how has your growth, how has your journey in the college or your university or institution been, uh, that's always good. So always aim for people who know you well, not for people who are well known but know you only let's say casually or something. So that's it for reference letters. And I think that's good. Should I talk about this? All right. Okay, so uh, so uh, for me, yes, there were uh, two interviews last year. I think uh, for Ritika, she said there were four rounds of interviews. Uh, for me, there were only, for me, there were only two rounds. So there was a preliminary interview and there, were, there was a final interview. After the preliminary interview, there was like a social engagement kind of thing where we met our panelists who were to interview us in a final interview and then the final interview was held. So uh, th the first round ends, uh, of course, so when the deadline is over, you get to hear about uh, if you have uh, gone on to the next stage, that is a preliminary round, I think, uh, by September and then the uh, preliminary interview for me was held in at the beginning of October and then by the end of October you know if you have progressed to the next round that is the final interview for me and then uh, the final interview was held uh, in the second week of November and then you get to know the results uh, on the same day itself after your interview. So yeah, so it's on the discussion of the Roads Committee if they want to conduct another interview, another round of interview that is a semi-final. Uh, but yeah, that is that is for you right now. You don't need to worry about. Excellent. Thank you, Khalid. I'm just going to take you through the website of the Roads Trust for India applications. Um, so everything that we have mentioned here so far, all of this is mentioned on the Roads Trust website. So your first port of contact should always be the website, which is roadshouse.ox.ac.uk. Um, and then when you click India, you will come to this page and it gives you everything. There are a few documents that you see at the bottom that have been 
um, linked. It's the information for candidates, guidance for referees, and the unofficial guide, including the courses covered by the Rhodes Scholarship or what are called as the conditions of tenure. Please, please make sure that you read these documents extremely carefully, especially the information for candidates. It is, it is inevitable for you to make mistakes if you don't read the information for candidates carefully. Everything, all the things, eligibility, what prompts you need to respond to in your documents, what heads should your CV generally contain, everything is mentioned in these documents. So please do take a little bit of time. You still have a lot of time. There's a, a month and a half. Take a few days to familiarize yourself with the website of the Rhodes Trust. This page, particularly the India page, which has all of these documents. And as I said, I was going to introduce you to your formal best friends. These are um, the information for candidates. It looks like this. There is a Word document of multiple pages and looks like this. It has everything. And some of uh, the information is in the form of questions. So you are able to understand them better and, and in an easier manner. So please do have a look at the information for candidates and make sure you're looking at the information for candidates for 2024, which will look like this. There are previous versions that are available more generally on the internet, but please make sure you download only the version that's available on the Rhodes House website. If you download anything else from Google, it might be from 20, let's say 20 or 2018 or 2019, when the requirements were much different from how they are today. So you will end up, you know, wasting time on a process that is redundant. Uh, so please make sure that you download the information for candidates and go through it carefully. Then there is the Road Scholarship for India guidance for referees. Have a look at this. Once again, it is very important for you to understand what you're going to ask your referees to write about. As Khalid mentioned, reference letters are some things that are not within your control, but it is helpful if you discuss these reference letters with your professors. And this also gives them a sense of what is expected of them. You can't just go up to a professor or someone and ask them to be a referee without giving them a sense of what they're expected to write, because then it will impact your application. If they write something very generic, for example, Ritika is a punctual student. She's the best student I've ever seen without going into details of, you know, what Ritika has done, what work she has done, how has the professor seen Ritika work, that reference letter will not be too helpful. So please make sure you familiarize once again yourselves with the guidance for referees. And then the detailed conditions of tenure. Um, Ritika mentioned most combinations of courses. In fact, most courses at Oxford are tenable on the Rhodes Scholarship. There are a few exceptions that you can't uh, choose. And those exceptions are written in the conditions of tenure. And there's some other information. And these are your formal best friends, which means that these are documents that are from the Rhodes Trust that um, manages the scholarships. So anything, if there is anything that any of us tell you or anyone in the world tells you that contradicts with these three documents, disregard that completely disregard that. Always go back to these documents and see what people have told you, the advice that they have given you. Does that match with these documents? If it does, okay, go for it. If it does not, disregard it. Um, and finally, the unofficial, your informal best friend is the alternative guide or the unofficial guide. This is again, a uh, a document of around more than 30 pages and it contains the collective wisdom of so many Rhodes Scholars. It is revised every year with the intention of making information and experiences available to information and experiences from Rhodes Scholars of you know, so many years available to the applicants. So this is, again, this is also on the website there in the form of unofficial guide. And then you will get this document. It has everything from tips to answers to your questions to how do you start your uh, personal statement? How do you start your um, academic statement? I'd say make this 
your best friend. Don't speak to anybody. If you have access to this, and which all of you do, if you have access to the unofficial guide, you don't need any other advice because this is the advice of more than 50 Rhodes scholars put together for you. So please make sure that you go through all the questions and answers in this. But the only caveat here is that this is unofficial. This is Rhodes scholars who have took out, who have taken out time to prepare the guide so that it is easier for applicants to navigate uh, the scholarship application process. So if there is at any point of time that you feel there is inconsistency between this and the official documents, it is always the official documents and the response of the Rhodes Trust and its national secretary in India that will prevail, right? So these are your best friends. Please make it a point to look at the information for candidates, the guidance for referees, the conditions of tenure, and the unofficial guide. And with this, we will now turn to questions and answers. I know there are quite a lot of questions already in chat, but I'll first hand over to, um, to Ritika. Uh, she has a, a comment to make. Hi, everyone. I Before we go ahead, I need to clarify something. I made a mistake and sincere apologies. I didn't have four interviews. I had three interviews in contrast to Khalid's two. Um, the thing that confused me was before my final interview, my referees were also called for a chat, a phone call. So I messed that up. So three interviews could happen, not four in my experience. Thank you. Excellent. So generally, there are two interviews, but in 2020 and 2021, given the pandemic, there were three interviews. But last year, when Khalid was selected, they again had, they reverted back to, uh, to their original you know, policy of two interviews. But there is always the possibility of a third interview, which is at the discretion of the selection committee. So um, just keep a note of that. And in any case, do not think about the interviews at this point in time. We just wanted you to get a sense of what the process will look like and the, what the timeline will look like. Otherwise, don't uh, worry too much about the interviews right now. Just focus on the application documents at this point. Um, great. There are a, a, a lot of questions, some uh, DMs and some um, in the general chat. Uh, and I will, for some of the questions, I'll read them quickly and answer them as quickly as possible because these are just yes and no questions and others I will turn to Khalid and Ritika. So um, someone wanted to clarify if it is just applicable for PhD or masters as well or the other way around. Rhodes scholarships are tenable at the University of Oxford for any postgraduate course, which means any masters and any PhD program. And as Ritika said, there are very few exceptions to the courses that you can take, and those are listed in the conditions of tenure. But general rule, if you want to do a master's or a PhD or a combination of the two, the road scholarship is for you. Um, are there any differences in the application process between masters and BPhil? Let's maybe spend a couple of minutes on this. Um, Khalid, I know you were a master's uh, applicant. Um, maybe just talk a little bit about what you mentioned in your academic statement of study, and then Ritika, who I know uh, was a one plus three applicant, can talk a little bit about the default part of her application. Uh, thank you. Uh, so uh, for my master's uh, statement, uh, the academic statement, I think both for DPhil and master's people who, are, who want to do a DPhil or a master's degree, uh, it's typically words. So for my master's statement, I, I outlined as was uh, said in the slide, uh, the course I wanted to do, why I felt I was a fit for that course, my existing knowledge in that area, uh, sort of not a literature review, but a sort of an indication that I knew uh, the scholars that are working in this field and uh, that I knew the faculty at Oxford at the Modern Salvation Studies Department in Oxford who were working on this field. 
and also the area that I wanted to work with, the work that I've already done, and uh, the, the, uh, the things that I think uh, this degree might help me learn and, uh, you know, add to my, uh, whatever, add to my knowledge to help me study this field more. So it, it sounds like a lot, but when you get down to it, you can do it. It's manageable in three periods. Thank you, Khalid. So when I was applying, I applied to both master's, master's plus DPhil, that is one year plus three year, one plus three courses, as well as only DPhil courses. And my background is in basic science. So I was also required to submit research proposals when I was applying for DPhils. So the key difference for a master's and a DPhil application in the sciences is, for a master's application, there are two things you do not have to do that you do have to do when you're applying for a DPhil. And those two things that you don't have to do for master's are, number one, get in touch with a potential DPhil supervisor before you apply. And although that's not, people say that it's not uh, compulsory, but most places they highly recommend that you get in touch with a potential supervisor for a DPhil if that's what you wanna go for. And the second thing you don't have to do for a master's usually is give a research proposal where you write what kind of questions are you are interested in um, pursuing or working on for your projects. So even if it's a taught master's with a research component, it doesn't mean that you have to write a research proposal. Some masters that are masters by research may ask that of you, but all of this information will be on the individual course pages that Oxford puts out. So in great detail. And apart from that, there are always differences between different kinds of DPhils, like there is a DPhil in physiology, anatomy, genetics, there's a DPhil in genomics, for example. And although they may sound similar, since they are assessed by different panels, they ask for different things. So you have to be very careful in what you're wanting to apply for. And another thing is uh, sometimes you can um, also, if you get the scholarship, use the same application material for your Oxford application, like Khalid was also saying earlier. Um, sometimes you can use the reference letters. Sometimes you can even change the reference letters. A anything works. but. Um, it's always, if you're applying for a, for a DPhil, it's always good to have a sense of what kind of stuff you want to do as a science student. And I don't know about other disciplines, but in sciences, it's, it's a good idea to have that sort of clarity, even if it's not completely clear beforehand, um, even before um, your interviews, maybe for the Rhodes Scholarship. I can quickly jump in about the pills in social sciences and humanities. So. Again, uh, you need a research proposal uh, when you are applying for a DPhil. And by the way, DPhils are PhDs at Oxford. There's no other difference. It's just a nomenclature difference. So for PhD slash DPhils at Oxford, you need a research proposal at the time of your application. So what are you going to research on? And it has to be in the form of a proposal. There's a question that you want to work on, um, especially in you know humanities and social sciences. Now. In your Rhodes application, you do not need to mention, you do not need to give a proposal. This has to form a part of your academic statement of study. So there you outline what you are going to work. Instead of, don't think of it as an additional document that you will need to submit if you are applying for a DPhil. It is still part of the same set of documents that every Rhodes applicant will make. Just that a master's student will talk about two masters that they will do and why they want to do those two masters programs. A DPhil student will just perhaps talk about what they want to work on in the DPhil and who they want to work with. And, and Ritika mentioned it is always helpful to get in touch with a potential, um, potential supervisor, but there are departments that outright they reject the idea of contacting a supervisor. So it's not important. Whatever the department in which you are applying for the DPhil decides is what you will go with. If the department says that there is no need to contact the supervisor, then there is no need to contact the supervisor. You can simply mention that this is the person that I want to work with in your academic statement. 
you don't need to have their consent. But if the department recommends that you reach out to them, as Ritika mentioned, happens in sciences, then please uh, do that because it's helpful to get a sense of whether you will be able to do the defil with that person in that department. Um, we hope that that clarifies. Uh, there are a lot of questions about the age limit, and I will quickly go over the age criteria once again. The age criteria continues to be 23 years. And I'll talk about when the exception applies. 23 is the final limit. There is, even if you're one, you, you know, you're 23 years and one day on the 1st of October this uh, year, you can't apply. Unfortunately, it's the very, very strict, um, you know, um, uh, criteria. And if you have any questions about that, always reach out to the, the Roads Trust, the official Roads Trust. Do not take the advice of anyone else apart from the officials of the Roads Trust on this issue, because it's a question of whether you're eligible or not, make or take, right? And so 23 continues to be the case, unless your first undergraduate degree was completed later. So if you completed your first undergrad degree, on or after 1st October 2022, only then does the 27 year uh, rule apply. But if you finished your degree, your first undergrad degree in 2021, no. If you're not 23 and below, you can't apply. The 27 criteria does not come into picture unless and until your first undergrad degree was completed on or after October 1st October 2022. So it's not a blanket rule that if you don't fit the 23, you will fit the 27 criteria. No, the rule is 23, but if you finished your first undergrad later, which is 1st October, 2022, then there is a relaxation. The idea is that there might be some people who for whatever reasons are not able to complete their first undergraduate degree in the normal sort of period of time that undergrad degrees are completed in. So that is the point on, um, on uh, you know, age criteria. Um, so there is the requirement of submitting transcripts um, and these transcripts must be of all the semesters and all the years that you have taken so far. I understand, and this is particularly true for students from Kashmir. There might be semester, like semester, you, you might be in semester eight and you still haven't written the exam for semester three. Unfortunately, it does happen in some universities due to a number of circumstances. And you won't have, you will have transcripts of one, two, four, five, six without the transcript of three. And that's okay because the application form will give you an opportunity to mention additional information. And there will be a column which says, is there anything else we need to know about this? And that's where you clarify. That's where you mention that, unfortunately, I do not have the transcript for semester three because my exam was delayed or the exam was canceled or whatever is the reason. But whatever you have available until today or until the day you submit your application, all of those transcripts should form a part of your application. Uh, there's a question on uh, hi, to prove this eligibility, that is, you have completed a school leaving exam, 10th or 12th, at a school in India. What is the nature of evidence? Is it a letter from the schools? Is a letter from the school sufficient or a school leaving certificate? Um, I would assume a school leaving certificate, but um, I, I don't have um, any significant idea about it. Vivika Khalid, anything? Yes, um, you can submit the mark sheet, the class 10, 12 mark sheets that um, tell which that uh, specify which school and which board you gave your exams with. So that's what I did, and that works. Great. Um, okay. And we will also be able to take questions if you raise your hands, and then we will ask you to unmute. But for now, let's continue. Uh, with the questions in chat. There's a question about the CV. Uh, should, should we write curriculum with it as one big header on the start of the CV or not? 
uh, if you mean to say saying you know a document which says CV at the top, no, uh, absolutely not. What you generally write at the top is your name. So Samir Ashikbat, that's it. If you want, you can mention, you know, for example, if when I was applying, I was a student at Gujarat National Law University. I had written year four Gujarat BLLB, Gujarat National Law University. But you, you don't have to write CV. It is already understood that it is a, a CV. Um, with regards to your personal statement and the prompts regarding the world, is it okay if the idea is a little different from your current profession of study or profession, or is it necessary to have congruency between them? Um, Ritika? Yes. So, uh, for example, if you mean what you're doing right then before you go to Oxford, then it is okay to want to pursue something else and want to do something else for the world, which is not exactly what you're doing right now. It's completely fine to switch fields, but the reason behind it or the why behind um, you wanting to switch fields or wanting to do something for the world that is not exactly what you're doing right now, that should be very clear in your writing. And um, with regards to what you want to do at Oxford, that, in my opinion, should have a bit of congruence with what you want to do in the long run, even if that's not what exactly does happen in your life, but in the in the statement, that's the requirement of the statement that you explain why you want to do what you want to do at Oxford with the Rhodes Scholarship. So that should be congruent, the future, the ideas for the future, but um, it's completely fine. For example, my undergrad was in zoology and here I'm doing neuroscience. They are both from the biological sciences, but are actually quite different. So why this switch, how it fits in with my long-term ambitions, if that is made clear, I think you're good to go. And, and to add to that, uh, I would say that if you are a bit switching your fields, please don't think that what you've already done, just because it's different from what you're trying to do is completely uh, you know, worthless or it doesn't matter to your application. You can, of course, show, as Ritika said, uh, why you want to switch the fields and what you've already learned from that and why you feel like switching the field would be beneficial to what you want to do in the future. So that kind of growth and movement, if you are able to reflect in your statement. Excellent. Um, there's a question. I'm applying for a one year course and start my legal directly after that in my second year. Do I need to prove or talk about the eligibility criteria for legal in the academic statement? Um, short answer yes, but I'll hand it once again to Ritika because Ritika applied for a one plus three. So there are some departments that offer separate masters and DPhil or PhD degrees, but the Rhodes Scholarship doesn't apply, uh, allow you to um, do a masters and a DPhil in that department. For example, the um, medical sciences division things, and it's all detailed in the conditions of tenure. But um, if you do want to do a master's followed by a DPhil that is not in those departments that you're barred from doing so in, then um, yes, it is always a good idea to talk about what kind of ideas you would like to work on in your DPhil after your master's and how doing the master's fits into the plan of perhaps doing a DPhil after the master's in that particular area. Also, I when I was applying for the master's and I was thinking about, um, when I was applying for the courses I applied to, they were all very similar. So like there is a course in neuroscience, there is a course in interdisciplinary biosciences, there's a course in physiology, anatomy, genetics, all of which can take me to the same research groups to work on the same research questions I want to. But what is different about all of these combinations of courses or all of these courses that are just titled different is what you need to understand and be able to express in what you are writing. But that by no means means that um, you have to pursue at Oxford exactly what you mentioned you want to pursue in your Rhodes Scholarship application. You can apply to 
that course, related courses, more than the courses that you um, have mentioned in your application. But um, yes, just um, if you do intend to do a DPhil after a master's and it is allowed by the scholarship, then it is a good idea to go over how everything fits into your long-term plans and eligibility uh, in terms of that if you meet the criteria for a defil with just a bachelor's degree which is possible in oxford then i don't see why you won't be eligible to do it after a master's so i don't think that should be any kind of there should be any kind of issue there um i am not sure if that's answering the question asked is am i missing something samir no, I think that's perfect. And just to add to that, you just have to think of, you have to, in your academic statement of study, say what you're going to do for the two years or more of the Rhodes Scholarship. You're saying that you're doing a master's in the first year, great. What are you doing in the second year? If you're doing the DPhil, then you have to talk about the DPhil. That, that, there's no doubt about it. If you're doing another master's, you have to talk about that master's then. And sometimes it becomes easy if you do them in the same department, for example, then you don't need to specify separate reasons, right? You, you, for example, you say, I'll do the master's in law and then the MPhil in law. Very, it's a clear, it's a very obvious progression. But if, if you want to say, I want to do a master's in law and then a master's in South Asian studies, you will have to explain a little bit for the second course why you want to do that second course. So the reasons tend to be slightly more nuanced. That's it. Otherwise, whatever your choice of courses is, whatever combination it is, you have to um, at all times justify that for DPhils. There is the additional requirement, or I would say an alternate requirement of mentioning what you want to do in the DPhil. Because think about it this way, master's programs are structured. There is a reading list that is given. There are courses that you will take. Everything is given to you. You just have to prepare. You just have to read that. In a DPhil, you are suggesting or proposing that you want to do something. There is no, there is no you know, structure already in place that you will come into and then participate in. You will present a proposal and then say that this is what I will do in my three or four years of the DPhil. So therefore for the DPhil, instead of talking about the courses that you will take, et cetera, you talk about what it is that you want to research and who you want to research with, because clearly you need supervision for that. Um, I think the next question is about SOP, and we can spend a few minutes here. Um, this um, is one of the most important parts of the application, your personal statement. And um, although we'll start with Tara's question on any tips on how to structure the SOP that can be very vast, abstract, and personal within the word limit in a way that it doesn't lose its entire essence or get watered down by the summing up, but we'll also talk more generally about the personal statement. I, I, I think we can start with Khalid, followed by Ritika, and then I will give whatever um, you know age-old wisdom I have. Khalid. Yeah, thank you, Samir. So uh, as, as far as SOP is concerned, a very important part of the writing process is that you spend a few weeks, I would say one or two weeks, thinking about the prompts, thinking about the criteria. So I would just walk you through what I did. The first thing that I did was I noted down uh, the prompts and the criteria on a piece of paper and I kept it uh, with me. And I kept going over them time and again for a week, I think for 10 days, just so that I could familiarize myself with what uh, the SOP wanted of me. And then I could think, think at the back of my mind uh, the things that I would likely include in an SOP. So I would suggest do not jump into writing the SOP straight away because if you do that, you will have right at the outset an authoritative kind of version which you will find it hard to improve upon. So the good thing is, uh, so the advice thing is, uh, advisable thing is uh, that you first jot down the, uh, the criteria, the prompts, and then under each heading, this is what I did, uh, mention what your beliefs regarding that prompt are, uh, how do you feel about that prompt, what have you done so far, what you think is lacking, and so on and so forth. Just kind of get a lot of material from which you will eventually write your recipe. So after this jotting down process is done, 
for me it was uh, it happened in this way uh, you prepare a first round or maybe after that you prepare a second or a third round and i would suggest that you put it on the computer only towards the end because once you put it down on the computer it feels very fine and even when you put it down on the computer uh, computer you will face the issue of you know uh, you have shot over the word limit and whatever i shot over the word limit by 750 words so i put a 1500 word sop initially and then i had to cut down everything and it felt like my sop had nothing by the end but but trust in the process part of the whole roads a uh, part of the whole process uh, the uh, part of applying for the word scholarship is in a way discovering what the scholarship is about and sop is a very important way of doing that and so stay with your sop and make sure that you i am not saying that you need to be a writer but be aware of what good writing or what are the good writing Etiquette when it comes to presenting yourself through the medium of language, right? So you have to be coherent. You have to be precise. Uh, you have to be, uh, you know, because it's only seven hundred fifty words. That that's like a four or five minute read, right? So you have to present yourself very, very succinctly. And uh, regarding anecdotes, if you go on the website, uh, you'll find a lot of these um, Ivy League uh, SOPs. Floating around, you know, full of anecdotes where they have made their whole lives into a sort of an extended metaphor and all that. But if you are using anecdotes, like uh, anecdotes as in personal stories, something that really, really inspired you, uh, if you are doing that, that's well and good. Everybody does that, even I did. But be sure to choose only the anecdotes which have really, really affected you in a way that you feel is very. fundamental to you as a human being right so when you list out the uh, prompts uh, just think about what has happened to you what have you done uh, that reflects my contribution or my whatever i have achieved in this field the best right and if you and if you frankly if you follow the three prompts laid out for you you are more than good to go uh, for the sop and uh, just keep revising it uh just keep editing it until you feel it's right and as long as it sticks to stick to the script uh i think you're uh, you're set and also if uh, on 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 occasions when you feel that you cannot uh, as in you, you have nothing to say on the subject or you are just going around in circles when you're trying to write about a prompt it's probably because it isn't clear in your head so i suggest that you spend more time and try to clarify what is it that you are trying to communicate in the sop right so yeah that's it's more that is so well put khalid i it is a treat for the years um another thing i'd like to add is um you must always realize that your sop academic statement and cv are a package so you don't want to repeat things um you might want to explain or put things in different contexts and perspectives but it's a coherent whole the whole the three things that you submit and the second thing is that uh, remember that you have an academic statement and you have a statement of purpose it's great that there are prompts in the sop this time which means that that is there is an inherent structure to the whole thing uh, so it really really helps um like khalid he did it on paper the way i did it was i made a presentation it was slightly weird because i was making a presentation about my life but it was very helpful to even visualize because sometimes when a panelist or a person who's reading through your documents is um going through them basically they will try to create a story about you in their head and it is very important that what they see in a possible upcoming interview is true to what they read and what they understand from the documents you submit so please make sure that it's original and completely true to what you are and what you hope to be um yeah that's it thank you thank you khalid and ritika that's beautiful i am just going to summarize uh, what you said in terms of key takeaways please spend a lot of time thinking about the uh, statements before you start writing i'll tell you 
one thing. If you look at the application process and think about what you need to write, you need to write 750 words and 350 words. That's actually not a lot of words. Like in terms of what you need to give, it's very, very little because you don't need anything else. CV, everybody has a CV. Transcripts, you have no role in that. Your university will give them to you and you just have to upload them. All you need to do is these two things. Reference letters, your FTs are doing. Essentially, if you tell someone that you only need to write 750 words and 350 words, they'll be like, oh, it's such a small thing to do. But if you ask any roads applicant over the last however many years, they will tell you how you know, stressful the process is. That is because you have to think quite a lot about it. So please do spend time thinking about what it is that you want to do, you know, what responses you might want to give to the prompts that they have given. And it is always very helpful to either follow what Kali did, it like on a piece of paper or what Tritika did in a uh, PowerPoint presentation. You might also want to choose Microsoft Word if that's more convenient to you, but just, or even a note or even, you know what I used to do? I used to have a, I still do have a WhatsApp group with myself. I just write my ideas there. So whenever I have to come back to it, I just have a look at it and, and then start expanding on them. And because your ideas will come to you at the most random places, you will be having dinner, someone will say something and it will stick to you and you're like, oh my God, this is such an important point that I should open your phone, immediately write it down on your note, wherever it is, then come back to it. Because if you just come and start, sit down in front of your laptop and decide to write the personal statement of 750 words, you will never be able to write a good personal statement. You will be able to write 750 words, but it won't be great. So please spend some time thinking about it. Write everything you can and then you know distill out the things that are not relevant. The other thing, extremely important, word limit 750 words. So you won't have, and do correct me, Khalid, because you are the most recent um, one who went through the process, you won't be allowed to upload a document. So there is absolutely no scope for you to write 751 words. It has to be 750 or less. So all the formatting, everything, you might italicize something, underline something, all of that will be gone. And you will have unnecessarily spent quite some time on you know, italicizing things and all of those things because it is a text only block with 750 limit and not a single word beyond 750 will be allowed. So sometimes we think that, okay, you know, it's not 750, it's 758, doesn't matter. And then you realize when you are submitting on the last day or the day before you realize, oh, damn it. Because those eight words, to remove those eight words at that point of time is way more stressful than removing them before. You won't know because your sentence will be incomplete and you will then need to redo the statement and think about exactly what you want to remove. So please remember that you are not uploading a personal statement of 350 words, of 750 words or an academic statement of 350 words. You are just copy pasting the text in that block and it will not give you even one extra word than 750. So keep it at all times under 750. So that's, uh, that would be my advice um, in terms of what Khalid and um, Ritika were saying. I'm also having a look at the questions here. There are some questions that they said that I will just say yes or no, or give a one-line answer to. Is the interview online or offline? Now that we are post in a post-pandemic world, they will most likely be offline in person, but you might have the first interview online and the second offline, which is in person. That's what happened last year in, for example, Khalid's case. Uh, second question, um, can the reference letters be generic or should they be addressed specifically to the roles trust? What, a quick thing about reference letters, they must specify the course that you are applying to and the scholarship that you are applying to. It can't be that I'm pleased to write a recommendation letter for Ritika Mukherjee uh, to your institute uh, for 
uh, her masters. No, it has to be specific. So when you are writing these reference letters, they need to be directed to the selection committee of the Rhodes Scholarship. But all of this information is in the guidance for it. Please, please do open that and go through that. Uh, links to all the guides on the Rhodes website and nowhere else, just on the Rhodes website. And all of this is available there. Can you please elaborate a little bit on the official transcripts? Official transcripts are basically your mark sheets. That's it. Now, in some universities, you get semester-wise mark sheets. In some universities, you get a full-fledged, you know, all the semesters put together. Whatever it is, whether it is semester-wise or all of them put together, that is what your mark sheets are. And I understand that quite a lot of universities take quite a lot of time to give you those mark sheets. So please start chasing them now because you don't want to be in a position where you have everything ready, but you don't have anything to upload in terms of uh, transcripts. Um, then there's a question, why do we need to specify second year of study in the academic? Yes, Aritika, sorry. Just one quick addition to the uh, transcript thing. Uh, in my university, at, during the pandemic, they weren't giving us transcripts. So we got our results after the exams online. And at, for one semester, I just submitted a screenshot. Even that worked. So any evidence works, really, if you don't have what exactly they're asking for. Yeah. Absolutely. Try getting the official ones. If you are not able to, screenshots work. But do make sure that you put in an explanation in the other information box and say that you know you did not have access to official ones. Um, thank you, um, Ritika. Uh, then why do we need to specify second year of study in academic statements as master's programs can be for one year? This is uh, something that I will should also I'm also guilty of. I always thought the Rhodes Scholarship was for a year, uh, but it's not. It is for two years. Uh, so you get the scholarship to do two degrees or basically to spend two years at Oxford, you choose what courses you want to do. So which is why you need to mention what you will do in the second year, even though most masters at Oxford are one year masters only. The scholarship is two years, which is why you have to say the second um, uh, course. My question is very simple. When it comes to the references, do the academic referees have to be permanent faculty members or can guest lectures do? Also for other two, in case I have been an RA under a postdoctoral fellow and a faculty member, uh, are they applicable as well? Uh, we lost Ritika, but Salim, do you want to have a go at this and then I can chip in? Uh, yes, yeah, so, uh, for references, uh... Yes, they could be guest lecturers, they could be ad hoc lecturers. It's completely fine. They don't have to be permanent faculty. In fact, two of my referees were ad hoc. So the only requirement, I think, uh, but you should go over the guidelines again, is that they should have taught you at the undergraduate level and graded. So if they have done that, they're more than eligible to write an academic uh, statement. Otherwise, I don't think there's an issue. Absolutely. Um, and any and any level, it doesn't matter whether they're an assistant professor or a lecturer or a postdoctor fellow, their uh, designation as such does not matter. The only criteria is that they should have taught you and graded you. And that grading can happen in multiple ways. If they've taught you a taught course, then yes. But if they have supervised you in your dissertation, then the grading can be that they have evaluated your dissertation or your paper. So that's also uh, equally possible. Um, great. I am 24 and looking to apply for DPhil funding, but was awarded my undergrad degree in 2019. Would this mean that I'm ineligible? Yes. I think we have already covered all the age-related questions. Um, then there's a question. Since the minimum term is two years, then would it be preferable to do two master's courses or apply for a DPhil following the master's program? In either, how do I decide the best path and will it make a difference in the application? Who wants to have a go at this first? Ritika? Yes. Um... It's a very important question, but I don't think it's something you need to worry excessively about right now. What you need to think about right now is what you want to get out of your time at Oxford. If this is um, 
if you want to do a long term project, if you want supervision from a particular person, then yes, it is cool to have a defil. Um, if you think that you are ready for a defil to take ownership of the work you want to do, drive your own uh, research, um, like soon enough, then you can apply for a direct defil. If you think you need to get some training before you do the defil, then you do a master's and then a defil, if that is permitted by the department that you're applying to. If you want to do two masters, get two kinds of training. So sometimes the reason why people also do masters is to um, do rotations or get a chance to work with more than one person to get a taste of different kinds of things within the same field before they settle on one particular thing that they do for their DFIL. So if that is what you want to do, then you can do a master's and a DFIL. If you want to get short-term experience of working with different kinds of people. Maybe you can do two related master's degrees or even two completely different master's degrees if you know why you want to do it. So honestly, it all depends on what you want to get out of your time at Oxford. Because of that, because it's so dependent on your ambitions, your motivations, there is a lot of flexibility in what you can apply for, what you can choose. <clears throat> so. Just think about that, go through the course listing and go through the conditions of tenure. Once you've thought about what is available and what you want, it is fairly simple to find some sort of an overlap and figure out what combinations work for you. If you're not very sure, then it's fine. It's totally fine. Just put in what you think could work best because after getting the scholarship, you apply to Oxford, right? In that time, you can apply to two or more courses at Oxford. So you have that flexibility, you have that choice even after getting the scholarship. So don't worry so much right now. Just think about, as I have said twice, what you want to do and uh, what enables you to do that best. For me, I needed training. After an, after an online bachelor's, which didn't make much sense to me because I wanted to do lab work, practical hands-on work, I needed master's level lab-based training. And so I applied for a master's. And um, there is in some places, in some courses, something known as doctoral training programs, which mean that you will do a master's and then you also do a DPhil and you just have to apply for it once. So instead of applying for master's and then next year applying for DPhil, I just applied for master's plus DPhil once. So um, that's a win-win for me. So do what works for you and just be aware that sometimes you cannot apply for master's followed by DPhil in some courses. You will have very clear guidelines on that in the conditions of tenure. Excellent. Uh anything or it should be more? I think we can. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, just to just one thing to add to what Ritika said. At the time of your roles application, it is a statement of your intent. What do you want to do? You will not be held accountable. Why did you not do that course? The one that you mentioned in your statement. If at this point of time it is correct, that's it. That's all it matters. You might end up doing a completely different course and we will, you know, only time will tell, but at the time of your OATS application, if that is what you want to do and that's what you have written on your OATS application, that's enough. But do think about it. And this is where, you know, do some thinking comes into picture is that you will be competing with people who have a definite idea about doing what they want to do, right? And then you will be perhaps a little bit hesitant. I don't know if I want to do two masters or a DPhil. So when you're applying, make the best case for whatever combination you choose. Whether you choose a master's plus master's, make the best case. That is what you have ever always wanted to do, right? Or a master's plus DPhil, that's what you can defend in front of you know, any committee in the world. Because you are competing with other people who know as a matter of fact that they want to do a master's and a master's or a master's and a DPhil. So it shouldn't be that in your application, you go to the interview and you're like, ah, I'm not really sure whether I want to do a master's and a DPhil or a master's plus a master's. No, at no point should this come up. You should be very certain in your application that this is the combination that you want to go with. Yes. 
after you're awarded the scholarship or after you undergo the process, your ideas might evolve. You might decide to do a completely different course and that's a different thing. But should, should you be able to defend the combination in the application process? Absolutely, yes. It should, there should be no hesitance uh, in um, hesitation, sorry, in, in, in being able to defend that combination. So just keep that in mind. Keeping that in mind, then there is a lot of flexibility with what you can do and cannot do. And, and Ritika has already explained that in great detail. Um, excellent. Is there a number, is there a limit to the number of times you can apply for the Rhodes Scholarship if you're not selected? Yes, you can only apply twice and that's it. Uh, if you haven't been selected previously, this is your only uh, and, and final chance. Can we ask our high school teacher for a character reference? Yes, you can. Um, hi, I am uh, pursuing a master's in computer science. I am in my last semester on my PG degree, and I don't have any research experience on research paper. What should I do? Am I eligible for the PhD? Uh, publications generally are not required. So long as, so whether you are eligible or not is not something that we can tell. What you will need to do is go to the PhD program or the DPhil program on the University of Oxford website, whichever PhD it is that you want to do. There will be a, a page on eligibility. If you meet that eligibility criteria, you are eligible. Uh, but in, in, in very, very brief, there is no expectation or requirement of publications. And publications in themselves or research experience in itself does not form a part of eligibility criteria. It strengthens your application. So if you are able to show other things that strengthen your application, you are still eligible and can make a good application. So don't worry about not having research experience as such, but you may be formally eligible. And that's where, you know, the previous uh, sort of answer to the previous question comes into a picture. That think about what you need. If you don't have research experience, you might need research training. So you might want to do a master's first followed by a DPhil instead of applying directly for a DPhil. So what is, what is it that you need and what is it that you want to do at Oxford? You want to do a doctoral research program, but are you equipped to do that? If you're not, then Rhodes is in fact one of the most flexible scholarships in the world. It, gives you the flexibility to design the program for yourself. Okay, I'll do the master's first and then I want to move on to the DPhil. So do think about that flexibility and what is your strong suit? What is it that you want to do at Oxford? All of these things while you are um, thinking about what courses to apply. Is giving IELTS or any English language test required for the scholarship? Very clear answer, no. I'm sorry, I'm doing a lot of talking. I, these are just questions that are very straightforward, but when there is experience sharing, I will move to Khalid and Ritika. Um, and I want to, there are still so many questions that I want to make sure that we get to as many as possible. Do they expect the CV to be anonymous? So should we remove personal identifiers like name? No, no it, 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 it is not, um, there is no blind review. Um, or anything like that. Uh, you, you will need to mention your name and all of your details in your CV. Um, only the undergrad is from institutions of... Is it only for undergrad students who studied from institutions of national importance uh, like IIM, et cetera? No, absolutely not. Um, okay, let's quickly, you know, state where we came from. I did my undergraduate degree from Gujarat National Law University. It is not an institute of national importance. It's not even a, even the best law school in India. There are other law schools that are better. So clearly not. Khalid and Pritika, do you want to tell where you came from? You might have come from an institute of eminence or excellence, and then this will defeat the purpose. But regardless, why don't you go ahead? Uh, yes, yeah, so I did my uh, bachelor's in English from St. Stephen's College. It is not an institute of eminence. 
it in fact didn't even make it to the top 10 of nirf rankings in the country so you don't have to worry about it i did my undergrad at miranda house which is the number one right now but that does that really does not matter your quality of work your what you studied that matters and what you write matters none of your institutions um status of eminence matters so please don't worry about that absolutely i mean in my year there was a, there was a road scholar from Gujarat National Law University, a university that hadn't produced a Rhodes Scholar till then. There was a Rhodes Scholar from Punjab University, but again, there was a Rhodes Scholar from Nagpur University. Um, so there were scholars from different universities that are not even, you know, the universities that are talked about. They're not even like Stephens and NLSs and IMs and whatnot. Uh, so there are, it's not that students from these universities um, are the ones who apply there are please feel free to apply if you think you meet the eligibility criteria if you think you're a strong candidate please do apply um i have completed my master's in 2023 can i apply for another master's yes you can apply for another master's um you will just need to perhaps explain why you're doing another master's in your academic statement but of course as um, all of us mentioned Rhodes Scholarship is for graduate or postgraduate degrees. So whether it's a DPL or a master's, uh, that's your choice. Does the age criteria apply even if I'm applying for a second master's? Yes, age criteria applies in all cases. Um, okay, um, three questions from someone who has uh, DM'd me. Uh, I only have done two research internships in development space and the other two are business and finance related. Since I wish to pursue an MSc in development economics, how should I go about shaping my work experience? Then the second question is, I have volunteered at two organizations like NSS and Rotaract. Additionally, started a project to ensure gender equality, which I'm no longer a part of. Thus, I'm a bit apprehensive about the impact uh, in this space. If the impact in this space would fulfill the expectation. And third, I wish to understand the significance of the role of publications in the overall application. Um, do the, either of you want to have a go at this and then I can talk about what you don't talk about. Um, just briefly about the, oops, sorry. Okay, just, just one no, thing, internships. So not all internships you do, not all work experience you do may completely align with what you want to do at Oxford. But what you have to focus on in that case is what you learned from it. And because there's always transferable skills that you can get from anything you do, even if it's a volunteering thing that you're no longer part of, do not try to fabricate any kind of... Um, or well, fabricate is a strong word. Do not try to extrapolate anything uh, in terms of impact the volunteer work made if you are not completely aware or if you do not have hard statistics. Um, if you cannot talk about how it impacted others, then it's always a good idea to focus on how it impacted you and informed your uh, ambitions. And um, the second thing is publications, right? Publications, I mean, I didn't have any when I was applying and uh, you're not even expected to. So don't worry about that. And one other thing about publications is when we say that word, we always think of research publications and formal journals, things like that. Um, while that may be true to a certain degree, you can even um, submit pieces that you've written for your college um, stuff like your, your college magazine or some sort of a blog that everyone contributes to even that counts it's not maybe a journal publication but it's something that you've written that's been published so don't uh, discount those efforts too thank you Rupita. I, I would just like to add to that is that uh, uh, as far as internships are concerned, uh, if you have done a lot of them, great. 
uh, that is what a CV is for. You can list all of them or as many as possible in that limited space. Uh, what you have to work on is how to integrate your, um, uh, how to kind of make your uh, statements and your CV work together. That is one thing that you should focus on. And secondly, yes, as Jitika said, that uh, publications don't only mean uh, what, uh, I mean, uh, publications in peer review journals or research articles that you have co written with a professor or another researcher or whatever. If you have done some work with, let's say, a college society or some other website or uh, I don't know, some news website or whatever. You can mention that also. In my CV, I uh, created hyperlinks for the articles that I had written for more accessibility. That's up to you. You can choose to do it or not to do it. And I, for one, can say that uh, one of the interviews in the final interview brought this up after the interview. After the interview was done, he said, okay, this is, I, I read what you had written, it was whatever, you liked it, and so on. So yes, you can include these things also. It does not have to be necessarily research articles or publications. And by whatever you mentioned, the internships that you have did, don't worry because I think you're already more qualified than what I was when I applied. So you're good to go. Just, just kind of see what fits in the narrative that you're presenting to the selection committee. And I think that's, that's it. Thank you both. Very quickly, it's not a game of numbers it is not a question of the number of internships that you have done it's the game it's not even a game but it is a question of quality of the work that you have done it is possible that you've just done one internship and that's so fundamental to what you want to do in life what you want to do at oxford why you have been doing everything and that may be enough it, so we do especially in today's linkedin and, and other culture, we do tend to, you know, go over, oh, how many internships have I done in the last three years? Have I done at least like, you know, four internships each year? So if by the end of my four years in law school, I should have at least four, four or 16 uh, internships. It's not about that at all. Just make sure that the work that you have done is of the quality that is required. Um, so two internships, enough. One internship, sometimes enough. Ten, I, I would say, you know, you've done a bit too much. You haven't perhaps engaged too well with everything that you are doing. If, and you, you won't even have the space to talk about all the ten internships. You will and eventually end up talking about one or two experiences. And uh, that's it. In, in I'll, I'll hand over to Ritika. But in relation to your second question, which was about volunteering at NSS and Rotaract and the project that you did, um, and which you're not a part of anymore, it, it doesn't matter whether you're a part of it or not. The fact that you started a project or you were involved with it demonstrates leadership uh, qualities, demonstrates that you care about certain issues that you wanted to do something about. So don't think of impact in terms of numbers. Um, as Ritika earlier mentioned, um, when she was talking about what all goes in a CV, and also, you know, in in the Rhodes criteria about leadership, leadership does not have to be formal leadership, you know, that you um, are the president of the student union or something. If you are, good for you. But if you are not, there are other ways in which you can demonstrate leadership. For example, you started a project, you realize there is a problem uh, or there is something that you want to address and you, you started working on it. That's absolutely okay. And in fact, good enough for um, meeting the, the requirements. Um, and then back to Ritika. Yeah, just um, one small thing about the internships is, even if you, so say you have three internships and of them one really shaped you a lot and you loved that more than the other two and the other two were not directly related to what you want to do in the future. That doesn't mean that you do not prepare pair to answer questions on the other two. Um, just be careful. You, you should know the basics of the other two as well. Even if that's not the main thing that you want to focus on anywhere, you cannot just forget what you did there. So of course, um, it's okay to have done several things, 
uh, of which you focus on some, that is what they want from you. But as you progress through the interview rounds, also nothing that you have to think about right now, but just a word of caution, as you progress through the interview rounds, the panelists will want to know you better and want to get a bigger picture of who you are, what you want, what you've done and what you want to do. In that space, it is important to also be aware of uh, the basis of everything you've done before, even if it's not directly linked to what you want to do next. Just a word of caution there. Yes, colleague. Yeah, just to add to what Ritika, uh, what, uh, Ritika said, be, please be absolutely thorough with everything that you mentioned in your CV, no matter how small of an internship or whatever position that you occupied you mentioned, because I know a friend uh, who mentioned something that he, a small AI research uh, internship that he had did, and one of the panelists in the final interview was a computer scientist, and he grilled him on it for 30 minutes. I mean, he eventually made it, he became a road scholar, but please be prepared for any questions that come your way, should you progress. So please be thorough with everything that you mentioned. Absolutely. I, I mean, the importance of authenticity, truthfulness, and honesty can't be understated. Uh, if that is a misrepresentation in your application, you, even if you're you know, awarded the road scholarship, you risk the chance of the Rhodes Scholarship being rescinded, or you risk the chance of being disqualified. Um, and there, there is a strong emphasis um, at the Rhodes Trust on truthfulness, honesty, and authenticity. So please, please do not make things up and, and be thorough with what um, you, know, you have mentioned in your application. Um, can someone do their second master's if they are still under 23? Yes, you can do as this might be your third master's and you might still want to do it. Just explain why. Um, there's a question. Since the scholarship does not cover PG diploma courses and the master's courses that do require enrollment in the Oxford PG diploma course, should the application for the scholarship be made after enrolling in the PG diploma course? Or can the course be taken up after the scholarship process gets completed? I have no idea about this. Ritika, anything? No. Um, whoever asked this question, it might be best that you reach out to the Rhodes Trust for an official clarification on this because these are two degrees that you are saying happen simultaneously. Um, you can. If PG diploma courses are not covered, then of course you can apply for the Rhodes Scholarship uh, for those courses, but for others you can. But please get this question clarified from the Rhodes Trust. Um, um, another addition, um, if you are not sure about your entry requirements, like I, when I wasn't sure at one point, uh, please do not hesitate to email the course contact given on the Oxford um, course page as well. Every course will have an email ID that you can um, reach out to for queries. And they are usually very prompt and very nice in their replies and clarifications. And sometimes they even um, agree to getting on a call with you to you know, figure things out. So uh, don't hesitate to email people and get things sorted if you're in doubt. Excellent. There is a student who um, already has an offer for the a modern South Asian studies program, but won't be able to take it and are planning to defer it. The question is um, if deferring makes them ineligible for the roads and other scholarships as well. Um, as you mentioned, if you defer a, a, a course, um, defer your admission, you're ineligible for the second round of application because you have already been considered for those. You're, ineligible for the second round of scholarships and funding is what I should say, uh, because you've already been considered for them in the previous year and not unfortunately been successful there. So yes, that's true. As for the roads, I think you need to apply to the university after you get the roads scholarship. So to already have an offer, um, a deferred admission, um, I'm not very sure about that, honestly. Um, Ritika? No, oh, unfortunately, even I don't really know 
but um, again same answer as the previous one please get this clarified because it's too bad you should I mean i'm sure uh, there is uh, some explanation for whatever the answer yes or no is so please um, write and find out or um, there's also a google group right samit that has more people that could maybe answer this question yeah uh, but, yes uh, there will be a link in the unofficial guide to the google group where you can ask questions that people will answer but because this relates to a, a fundamental eligibility question i would still um, and not just still, I would at all times ask this question to a, the roadsters as opposed to any scholar. Yes. Um, and another thing is, um, even in the guidance for Indian applicants, uh, even if you do not maybe get a reply from the National Secretary's office, because there is a lot of questions and emails they'll be handling right now, then do not hesitate to write to the registrar themselves, uh, because that is their email is given in the documents for you to reach out to if you have questions about eligibility or course combinations or even things like whether or not you can get an additional year of funding, et cetera, et cetera. So any such question where, which is a slightly unusual question, uh, they, the registrar, the roads registrar has provided their email in the documents for you to reach out to them to find out the answer to. Excellent. Uh, will the offline interview be held in India? Yes. Um, the reference letters need to be addressed to roads. Yes, as we said, there is a guidance for refer referees in which it mentions who it should be addressed to. Um, I am currently in my first year of master's. It is necessary to have a lot of research published in your name to have a chance to be selected. We have already answered this question. Um, research public publications are not required, but they strengthen your application. But equally, there are other ways in which you can show uh, the strength of your application. How are letters of recommendation and reference letters different? They are the same. They aren't. Um, I am 24 and will finish my master. This will I be eligible? Unfortunately, not. Um, unless your first undergraduate degree uh, was completed on or after 1st October 2022. Regarding the criteria of showing energy to use your talents to the fullest, is it necessary that one should have pursued the activity like dance even in undergrad? Because in my case, due to studies, I could not do it as well as I did in for the last seven to eight years in school and first years, but not the rest four years of undergraduate degree. Um, I will go at it. It's fine. It's okay. <laughs> I had same situation here. Don't worry. Go for it. Still mention it. Still talk about it. It's it's all right. Don't don't not mention that you learned for those many years, even if you haven't been in touch recently. Excellent. Can you explain the point of IELTS once again more clearly? Let us. Um, for the Rhodes Scholarship, for your application to the Rhodes Scholarship. You do not need to provide evidence of English language, whether that is IELTS or TOEFL. You do not need to. Eventually, in your application to the University of Oxford, you might need to show evidence of English language proficiency through IELTS or TOEFL. But for the Rhodes Scholarship application, you do not need to show IELTS and IELTS score. I hope that is. Uh, that explanation is clear enough. Uh, can you please explain once again the point about transcripts? Transcripts are basically your marks card, mark sheets. So you need to, if you have finished your undergrad degree or whatever degrees you have finished, you need to show the marks card, marks sheets for them uh, through this application. If you are already, if you are currently pursuing a degree, then whatever marks sheets that, that you have, you show those. And the, the point that we were mentioning earlier is that you might not have mark sheets for a particular semester. And that's okay. You just need to specify the reason why you don't have mark sheets. Otherwise, all the mark sheets that you have available till now are the ones that you need to mention. And mark sheets are transcripts. There are different, you know, there's different nomenclature that's used for transcripts and mark sheets. Do you, do you have to fill another application for the course in Oxford other than the road since it is an application for the scholarship? Yes, 
this current application that you will be making will be for the Rhodes Scholarship. Once you are awarded the Rhodes Scholarship, you will need to make a separate application to the University of Oxford for your courses. In your CV, when you mention your experience, is it advised to give a short description of what you did and learned during that opportunity to frame it according to what you wish to convey about your skills? Um, yes, short answer, but over to Khalid and Ritika for perhaps a different point of view or this confirmation of this. Sunil, could you please read out the question once again? Yes. Uh, it is in your CV when you mention your experience. Is, is it advised to give a description about that experience uh, of what you did and learned during that opportunity to frame it according to what you wish to convey about your skills? Uh, yes, thank you, Sunil. So, yes, that's, I think, for me, it was very important because, uh, uh, I mean, uh, how I framed it was in terms of contribution, as in if, I, if there was an internship that I did, what was my contribution or what was my position in that particular company or organization? So yes, I would advise please provide a brief description, not a very long, but a one or two liner about uh, your role in that particular organization or uh, company. Uh, for whatever internship or for a position that you had in the in a society in your college or institution or as part of the students union in your uh, institution whatever you do i think a description would be good would be a good idea excellent um, so those of you who are asking questions about other scholarships i have very conveniently skipped them because we want to dedicate this time to questions on the road scholarship but you might find more information about other scholarships and other funding opportunities on our website, www.projectedivaxel.com for a nice plugin. Okay, got, um, just one thing, uh, what makes one's application stand out concerning the CV? So what is an excellent CV, Ritika? I think an organized CV is an excellent CV and a CV that conveys everything in a manner that's not like, you don't want to throw information at the reader. You want to frame it in a manner that flows well. Um, also in the descriptions you gave of your contributions, sometimes you have a lot of contributions and it might you know be tough to fit things in. Remember that you just don't have to always write full sentences, make it to the point. And uh, because this is a CV, it's not your statement. Um, but yes, outline the keywords and the key contributions, the main things that define what you that define what you did. And um, yeah, just organize it very well. Make sure you use a good font. Don't use too many colors. Don't make it um, funny looking. Um, stick to basic fonts and um, outlines there are some good templates available even if you don't use templates you do it simple it's fine uh, you can play around with the margins a little bit use some narrow margins but don't stick too much together don't make it cramped just yeah just it has to be visually pleasing and easy to uh, navigate through uh, one thing i did was i highlighted the uh, things that i wanted to uh, make sure the reader did not miss. Like I put them in bold among the list of achievements or list of internships, the ones that I um, contributed to most, I highlighted them. Also one more thing um, that falls in with previous uh, questions about publication. Sometimes you don't have a publication out, but it is in press or it is going undergoing review or it is in preparation. So you can always mention that in your CV as well. Um, but you have to make sure that you say that it is in prep if you're preparing, if, if you're working on it or it is in press if it's being reviewed, things like that. There, there are guidelines for that you can find online. Yeah. Great. I have thoughts about CV, uh, but today is not a session on the CV, but 
you don't need to mention everything in your CV. That's the first thing. Second is you have two pages and you will have done a lot more than fits in two pages. So it's a question of prioritizing what is relevant and what is not. So do one thing, create a master CV where you have listed everything, you know, everything that you've done till now, whether that is uh, won a dance competition in grade two in your school, or whether it's a, a, a you know high stakes internship that you did in your undergrad, every single thing that can be in your master CV. And then when you prepare your CV for the Rhodes Scholarship, think of things that you think are relevant. There will be things that fall further down in the priority list, leave them out. And then, you know, you will now start asking yourself a question. If you have um, a blog publication and you have a, a voluntary, uh, you know, experience, which one should I pick? Now, all of these questions you will need to answer in light of your overall application. Are you applying for a DPIL? Uh, where perhaps your research is more important, your research experience is more important than the blog perhaps would, you know, be, would take precedence over voluntary experience. Or are you trying to show that you are someone who deeply cares about the world, having discussed other things, then maybe the voluntary experience will feature in your CV. It is a question of prioritizing. So please make a list of everything. Don't discount. Don't think that something is irrelevant. Uh, right at the beginning, make a list and then, you know, keep evaluating their uh, priority and, and their relevance to your application and then mention them in your CV. And perfect. Then there's the next question. Would having a program degree and not an honors be a disadvantage? No, absolutely not. Um, so long as you have an undergraduate degree, it doesn't matter whether it's an honors or a non-honors degree. Is GPA 8.5 decent? You, nobody will ever be able to tell you what is decent and what is not. You meet the eligibility requirements in your uh, for your program at Oxford. That great. Are you at somewhere at the top of your class? You know, as, as Ritika mentioned earlier, the the higher you are, the better it is. But being absolutely at the top of the class is not necessary, and it is not about the objective marks that you have got. It is possible that someone gets a 90% in the university uh, and is the topper of the batch. And it's possible that another person in another university gets 67% and it's still the topper of the batch. So you can't say that the person who got 67% is less intelligent or less meritorious than the person who got 90%. It's just that the two universities have a different marking sort of structure. So objectively, 67 and 90 does not tell us anything. Where do these two individuals stand in their class, in their university, is what is relevant. So your relative rank, your relative position compared to other people in your program, in your degree, is what matters. So don't go by numbers as such, once again. Um, could you explain about the LLM? Does it have to provide, do I have to provide uh, research to them? When you're applying for a master's in law, program, which is the BCL here at Oxford, you don't need to uh, explain your research proposal or anything for that matter, because it's a taught degree. So you will need to explain why you want to do the courses that you want to do and how it fits with your larger career trajectory. So you know, you don't need to provide a research proposal. If one wishes to pursue a nine month research degree, or sorry, nine, nine month degree at Oxford, would that be eligible for Oats? Yes. When, you, when we talk about one-year master's programs, they're either nine or 11 or 12 months at Oxford, and they're all considered one-year masters. So in essence, they might be nine months only, but they're still considered to be one-year masters. Would having a BA degree in classical music plan qualify as excellence in arts, even if I did not engage with it too, too actively after completing the degree? Um, but I would think my preliminary thoughts would be that that's your academic degree, that's your degree. More than uh, you know, showing excellence in arts, it is your qualifying degree. And if within that degree you have excelled in arts, then yes, of course, it also shows um, excellence in arts. But if it's your qualifying degree on the basis of which you're applying for the Rhodes Scholarship or for masters at Oxford, 
then it is more relevant for the academic criteria of your application. Um, Khalid, would you agree? I, I can disagree as well. <laughs> Yes, yes, I, I, I completely agree with that. I don't think there's any problem. Great. Um, so there's some, uh, someone who has uh, followed up and says that their undergraduate was completed in August 21 and uh, their master's will be completed in 23. Will they be eligible? Unfortunately, not because your first degree was completed before uh, 2022, 1st October. My, I need some help with reference letters. My professors have agreed for being uh, agreed to write the reference letter, but want me to write the reference letter. It is kind of difficult to write three. Uh, did anyone face this? Any suggestions? Ali. I'm sorry. So the professors are asking the person to write the reference letters. But that's, uh, I don't think that's allowed. <laughs> Uh, the professors have to write your references by themselves. You have no role to play insofar as writing is concerned. You can obviously discuss your reference letters with the professors. They might ask you for writing samples. They might ask you for your statements or your CV. But as far as writing it is concerned, as far as, um, uh, you know, including your various achievements or whatever, writing it down that's not your business that's your uh, referee's job and if you have if you have a role to play in that if you end up writing some of that i think that is actually grounds for disqualification later so please uh, make sure that your referees write your references and not you absolutely just one thing to add there um, it might be helpful to sit down and help your referee um, formulate a few thoughts about what they would like to put into the reference letter. I'm saying this only because uh, in my situation, for example, my undergrad degree, a lot of the teaching, a lot of the grading was online. And although I had been graded by a particular teacher, a particular professor, and they did know my work, they didn't really engage with me as deeply as they would have had I been going to college physically, right? So it helped me to get on a video call with them to um, help them consolidate their views about me. And then they wrote it themselves. So maybe if you're able to arrange something like that, it might help your referee. Absolutely. Well, do discuss it with them. Do tell them the importance of reference letters in your application and the importance of uh, them writing the uh, the application, uh, sorry, the, the reference. Um, uh, one more thing, it's important to recognize that this is probably the uh, time when many students will approach them. So give them enough time to write the letter because they'll have, they'll be doing this for several students. So yeah, just give them enough time and give them enough context before you approach them. Excellent. I understand that we have been here for two hours already, and we will just take the last few questions uh, as quickly as possible and then bring this yeah. to a close. Um, so is there, are there any scholarships for University of Oxford that don't have age criteria? Yes. Rhodes is perhaps the only one that has this age criteria. You can look at our website once again in the resources section. We have conducted workshops on a number of work, uh, scholarships that are tenable at Oxford that don't have an age criteria. During the pandemic, I couldn't attend my first and second semester exams and attended them later on. So I have two transcripts for a single semester, one mentioning I was absent and one with my marks. Does that count as backlog? I don't think backlog as such is a problem in itself. You need to show the true picture the selection committee of your transcripts provide all the transcripts and as i mentioned if there is some kind of an explanation like the one that you're providing now you can um, provide this in the application where additional information is asked of you but what what matters is have you completed the degree uh, it doesn't matter really as such for the purposes of eligibility as to when you completed it, how you completed it. You need, but you can't give a 
give an untrue picture to the selection committee. You have to give a clear and true picture to the selection committee. So if you took two attempts, for example, you need to show both the uh, transcripts. But in your case, if you didn't say it and it says zero, and then you start for the exam and you have the actual transcript, even then you need to show both and you can append an explanation as to why in the first transcript that is a zero or uh, or absence that is noted in the transcript. Um, when is the ideal time to start the application process for admission for 2024? If you're applying for the Rhodes Scholarship, now is the ideal time because applications are already open and will close on the 1st of August. So you have a, a month and a half to, 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 to write up your application documents. Uh, but for other processes, there is some time, so you can you can take it a bit slow. Um, uh, I will be 24 by October 2023, and I was awarded the degree in 2022 with examination ending in 2021. Would I be ineligible for the scholarship? I think so, but you will need to clarify it with uh, the Rhodes Trust uh, because you are examination your formal requirements ended in 2021 uh it, it doesn't matter when it was awarded you can have your graduation sometimes three years later but your formal requirement is what matters and if that was 2021 then unfortunately you won't be eligible um great i'm 25 have completed my masters i want to apply for phd not eligible yes unfortunately not eligible uh the, yeah, there's someone who has sent a question to you, Ritika, through direct message. Uh, yes, so I think that's David, and they also have their hand raised. So if you'd like to ask the question, yes, because yes. it's a pertinent question. Yeah. 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 So I basically have two questions, like for for Kali, then you because uh, like you both are from Delhi University also. So uh, I'm in. I'm I'm studying like I'm a final student, uh, final year, uh, student from Hindu College. So how much exactly like CGPA comes under like first division? So that's my first question, and and second question is like there is a professor in in the department like that is from arts faculty. So he has been my mentor to my research and everything. So like he had he he didn't taught me officially and and he didn't graded me officially. But but like he has been my mentor like uh so everything. So can I take Elva from him and and I also did some internships from several organizations. So are they eligible to give? LOR because they know my some professionally like they know me professionally so yeah I have this question thank you David just two things first um first about the LORs I think you can take you you it would be a good idea to get a character reference from this person instead because I was in a similar situation and I got a character reference from my uh, mentor who did not officially grade me but could uh, talk about my work ethics blah 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 things that define my character it was a good uh, way around this problem and um, about the CGPA again there is no formal in to my knowledge, there is no number I can give you, but in general, what I tell my Delhi University juniors is something like try to maintain it above 8.5 consistently throughout all semesters. That's what I told them, but I may be completely wrong. So don't take my word for this. Um, Khalid might have a different answer, so I have no idea yeah, sure. what is um, so, the right uh, number. Thank, thank you, Ritika. If I may just chip in, uh, the 8.5 uh, CGP, I think uh, that works for science, but for humanities, we are graded much less in Delhi University. So I think if you go to the course page on Oxford and the courses that you want to do, you will see that they have their own requirements. Uh, so the UK grading system is a little different. It's, I think, first class honors and second class honors. So it's upper, for upper second division, lower second division. So basically, in the Rhodes uh, document, it says that it's advised to have a first class honors, I think. 
which is which comes to around seventy uh, percent or above in their grading. And for us, it would be if you are graded on a GPA scale, it would be around eight or above. So if you are a humanities student, you did philosophy, anything above eight works. In unofficially, uh, but officially, uh, as uh, Sameer said earlier. Uh, the grading system is really relative. It's if you are compared against your fellow competitors and applicants. So you might feel that you have scored less, but please don't let that deter you from applying. Just one, yeah, no, one more thing here, David. I didn't achieve the eight point five thing that I was saying. I didn't get it, and I was I I was uh, mm -hmm. doubt myself. So I wrote to the course. Uh, organizer, uh, the person who runs the course that I am part of right now in Oxford, to ask if she thought I was eligible, and she said yes, you are. So, if at all you have a doubt like that, get it cleared ASAP, and yeah. don't worry. About it. Just, just uh, no. If if you think you are a good student and you are in the top few of your class, then don't worry about the numbers. Really, thank you, thank you so much. Solid number, I, as far as I know. Thank you. We have time for just one more question. Uh, uh, Ridu. Uh, right. Uh, first of all, thank you so much, guys, for conducting this session. And uh, my question is that since uh, I think David mentioned about the CGP, um, and also Khaled talked about the eligibility um, that is required, uh, which is mentioned in the course site. So uh, if in case whatever course that I'm choosing, if they mention if they're mentioning mentioning a particular eligibility CGP that I like need, so um, do I need to fulfill that in order to apply for the scholarship? Uh, thank you, Rito. Uh, at this stage, I don't think that uh, as part of your application you need to fulfill those uh, th that criteria. Uh, those criteria for of you know CGPA and your academic achievements, but please be aware that the committee will know what course you want to apply for, and they are aware that there are these uh, criteria that you need to fulfill, and they will take that into account. So I remember distinctly that uh, when I went for my interview, there was a big paper in front of them, and in very bold letters, right at the top. Uh, there was written my CGPA. So I am sure that they do take that into account. What role that plays into the overall application that you make, I'm not too sure. Uh, but yes, uh, you should consider it. All right. Thank you so much. Just to add to that, uh, it is absolutely important that you meet the requirement. It might be that right now you don't need them because you don't have your full marks and transcripts with you, but you need to be sure that you will meet the requirements of the course that you are, you are choosing. Because if you apply to the Rhodes Scholarship for a particular course for which you don't meet the eligibility cri criteria, then you don't remain eligible for the Rhodes Scholarship either because you're not eligible for the course. The course is what you want the scholarship for. There is absolutely nothing that can be done. The Rhodes Scholarship is confirmed on the applicant only after they get their admission in the university. So please make sure that don't think of it as uh, you know that it's fine if you don't meet the eligibility criteria, you can still run with that course. You will be asked or like even at the application stage, the selection committee will see, okay, you want to apply to this course, but their um, sort of marks and everything, the profile does not meet the eligibility criteria. It will be detrimental to your application. With that, the lights in my room are also giving up and we have to um, bring this to a close. I have put a link in chat. This is our Instagram page, Project Edu Access. Um, we post information about all the workshops that we run there and uh, all other social media as well. Um, so please do uh, stay tuned. And we are going to, this was the first workshop of the next admission cycle. We're going to run a lot more um, as those of you who are familiar with Project Edu Access will know we do. Um, but uh, please join me in thanking Khalid and Ritika for uh, spending so much of time um, on a Sunday afternoon for Ritika and evening for Khalid um, when they could have been doing 
much better, much more fun things. Uh, perhaps I know Ritika is in the lab just like me. Uh, so um, yes, thank you so much, Khalid and Ritika, for sharing your experiences and uh, all the best to everybody. If you have any questions, please refer to the information for candidates and the documents that we listed. A recording of this um, session will be available on um, our social media. You will get the link there. So, um, so yeah, do uh, do watch it if you missed any part. And the PPD that we ran in the beginning will also be a part of the recording. So uh, you can have a look at that. Um, all the best, everybody. Um, and believe in yourselves. I'm sure you will all do quite well. Okay. Bye-bye.